Well, hello again, everybody. Welcome to Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. We're very glad you could join us for another edition of Virtual Voices of the Game. Uh, my name is uh, Bruce Marcus, and I work in the Hall's Education Department. Today, it'll be my pleasure to uh, talk to a longtime friend of the Hall of Fame. He is um, one of the leading historians and researchers on the subject of Black baseball and also a prolific author as well. Uh, he'll be joining us today, Larry Lester, to talk about a number of topics. Uh, we want to go back to some old business. Uh, we haven't had Larry on uh, in a while. We want to get his thoughts on uh, two of last year's inductees to the Hall of Fame, Bud Fowler and Buck O'Neill. We haven't talked to Larry about that, so we'll do that. We'll talk about his involvement with the Hall of Fame's Black Baseball Initiative, which is ongoing and is really going to pick up steam in 2024 when we open up our new Black Baseball exhibit. Uh, we'll also get Larry's thoughts on his very generous donation of many recorded interviews uh, with some notable figures from Black Baseball history. Looking forward to that part of the conversation as well. Uh, he is the co-founder of the Negro Leagues Museum. He's written numerous books about the Negro Leagues and about Black baseball in general, has received such prestigious awards as the Henry Chadwick Award from the Society for American Baseball Research and the Bob Davids Award, also from Sabre. Those are about the two best awards you can get from Sabre. Uh, Larry has won some other awards as well. Larry, welcome to the program. Thanks for being with us. How are you today? We're doing great, Bruce. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Always fun to talk to you about uh, uh, the subject of Black baseball, and you're certainly one of the people uh, that knows an awful lot about it. You've written about it. These are just a few of the books that you've worked on over the years. Baseball's first Colored World Series. Uh, you've done a couple of volumes of the Negro Leagues book, uh, also Black Baseball in New York. I really first became aware of you when I started working as a researcher here at the Hall of Fame in the library in the mid 1990s. And that first edition of the Negro Leagues book that you did with the late Dick Clark uh, was one of the resources that we used uh, frequently, it helped us answer a lot of questions, especially in the days before the internet really took hold. So that was <laughs> yeah. uh, certainly uh, valuable for us. Larry, before we get into the topics I mentioned earlier, I want to get into your background. You were born in the town of Charleston, Arkansas. Uh, you grew up in a segregated neighborhood. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I saw in another interview that you did, when you were growing up, you kind of asked yourself, where are all the black ball players? <laughs> Tell yes. us about that. Well, yes, I grew up in a small town in Arkansas, population 900, and moved to Kansas City when I was around two years old. Uh, I lived in an all-black neighborhood, went to an all-black school, all-black church, and uh, lived on 27th in Brooklyn, uh, just five blocks from uh, Municipal Stadium on 22nd in Brooklyn. Mm. And so I would see the cars full of white uh, people come to the games. And I would walk down the street and pay a dollar and 50 cents and walk in and see more white people than I ever seen in my life because as far as I could walk, I could, I saw nothing but black folks. And then I saw these white people in this stadium and I just wanted to know where were the black ball players on the field. And uh, curiosity became my philosophy at that point. And I would talk to, to the elders in the neighborhood and they would tell me about the great players from the Negro Leagues, like Hilton Smith and uh, Ernie Banks and Coo Papa Bell and Satchel Paige and Buck O'Neill. And it really peeved my interest to how do I find out more about them? And it was an awakening for me uh, when they said, well, Ed Charles lives a couple of blocks over, plays for the athletics. And we would go over there and visit with him. He would give us gloves and baseballs and Buck O'Neill lived about on 31st Street within walking distance. And, and we had Connie Johnson in the neighborhood and John White, a pitcher for the Kansas City Athletics was there. Uh, all the black ball players lived in our neighborhood because Kansas City was one of the most segregated cities in the country. 
Mm. And so I found that to be of value that all my resources were nearby. And uh, it, it became somewhat of a challenge because there was no books written until I got to uh, middle school. And as I entered high school, I came across this book called Maybe I'll Pitch Forever by David Lippman about Satchel Paige. Hmm. And I would read parts of that book every night as a, as a uh, high school freshman. And then, of course, in high school, I went to school with Satchel Paige's three daughters, uh, Pamela, Shirley, and Rita. And so I would share anecdotes from that book with them in the classroom. And they, they would shake their heads because they knew what I knew as a baseball fan that their dad didn't win 2,500 games and pitched 50 no hitters. I mean, but it was fun reading and I kind of just put everything on the back burner as I continued to learn more about the black ball players in my neighborhood and the absence of black ball players on the field for the Kansas City Athletics. So that was the big challenge back then, Bruce. And uh, some of my favorite ball players were the players of color uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, like Harry, Harry Suitcase Simpson and mm. Jose Santiago, Vic Power. And my favorite ball player was Hector Lopez. And I carried this baseball card around in my wallet and told everybody he was my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you just love baseball. And it was such a challenge. And, and it became even bigger because in 1960, the athletics did not have a single player of color on their team the entire season. Really? And you know, 1960s, that's a year after the Boston Red Sox integrated uh, their team with Pumpsy Green. So it was a challenge back then to learn anything about black baseball. And I've been so blessed to be involved in this journey because as that turned out after I started to meet more and more players and their wives and their families, I didn't realize that Aura O'Neill, my grade school teacher, was Buck's, was Buck's wife. So, wow. I, you know, I've been blessed in so many ways to be involved and to be a part of the baseball family. You make a great point about those Kansas City Athletics teams that were first owned by Arnold Johnson and then by Charlie <laughs> Finley who eventually moved the franchise to Oakland. But it really wasn't until the Oakland years that we saw those great black players join the A's, the, uh, the Vita Blues. Uh, Blue Moon Odom did pitch briefly in Kansas City, but his best years were probably with Oakland. Uh, you had Billy North. Of course, you had uh, Reggie Jackson. Uh, so the, those teams in Oakland, far more integrated uh, than, than the Kansas City uh, teams. Um, Ed Charles, though, is an interesting guy. He did play for the Kansas City A's. Uh, he was one of the better players there. How well did you get to know Ed Charles? Uh, a little bit. Uh, he was nearby. Uh, I would get to the game early and watch him go through his routine at third base. Uh, he was very gracious. Uh, did a lot of tricks on the third base corner, and he would throw me a ball every now and then. Uh, great experience. Uh, I could go to as many games as I wanted because the price is only a dollar and 50 cents and you get in and because of low attendance by the third or fourth inning, I could move closer to the competition. But Ed Charles and I, we became close friends over the years and I'm still in contact with his son, who's yeah. another poet, by the way. Really? But uh, it was so much fun. Uh, I got my dream job at the age of 16 in 1966. I became a vendor at the stadium and sold peanuts. So I got to go to all the games free and watch baseball. And and you mentioned the A's, you know, in 67, they had that great athletic team where we had three people from Arizona State University, Reggie Jackson, Sal Bando at third, and Rick Mundy in center field. Mm. And I, I thought I was in heaven. Of course, they had catfish on that team and and Blue Moon Odom was on that team too. So yeah, 67, my senior year, I was so excited. But as you know, uh, Charlie took away my dream job and moved the team to Oakland, <laughs> which is probably mm -hmm. a good thing. 
uh, working off a 15% commission as a peanut vendor was not going to be a sustainable living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. John Wyatt was another African-American player who played for the A's. You mentioned him earlier. You get to know him at all? Yes, John was a little bit reserved. Uh, <clears throat> he built a small apartment complex, oh, about four blocks over, and mm. was ridiculed by the press uh, that, that, that this black man is making too much money to build a little apartment. But <clears throat> he was real nice, low key. Uh, he married the daughter of a Negro League player by the name of DeWitt Woody Smallwood, who played with the New York Black Yankees. Mm. So uh, John was always nice, uh, you know, almost impossible to watch because he always seemed like he would always walk the bases full before he struck out the side. So he, he gave me a lot of headaches and heart heart pain back then. Larry, I want to talk to you about last year's Hall of Fame class. Uh, since we talked to you, and it was more than a year ago, Bud Fowler and Buck O'Neill elected and officially inducted into the Hall of Fame. I wanted to get your thoughts on each of these new Hall of Famers. Uh, first, Bud Fowler. And I've heard people say, uh, well, he was primarily a minor league player. <laughs> what makes him a Hall of Famer? Because the story goes well beyond that. Well, <clears throat> briefly and concisely, what makes Bud Fowler <clears throat> a Hall of Famer is he played during a segregated time of our country under Jim Crow laws. So why was this man asked to play on predominantly white teams, roughly 30 or more teams, unless he was an outstanding ball player and a gentleman? Uh, he must have been very, very talented for, for baseball teams to seek his skill set. And that's why he belongs in the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. And there's little doubt that if not for the racism of that time period, he would have been a major league player, right? Oh, no doubt about it. He, he yeah. was a good fielder, good hitter, uh, <clears throat> excellent all-around ball player. Played multiple positions, as <laughs> I recall. Played uh, some second base. Yes. Was also a pitcher. So really a well-rounded, versatile player. Um, so Bud Fowler, member of the Hall of Fame, uh, class of 2022, um, not as well known as this gentleman, Buck O'Neill, who finally <laughs> did make it to the Hall of Fame after years of consideration. You know, we think of Buck and he did a little bit of everything. He was a player, a manager, a coach, a scout, and then really for the latter part of his life, uh, a huge ambassador for the game of baseball. And when you think about all around contributors to the game, here's a guy that's at the top of the list. Oh, without a doubt, uh, Buck O'Neill and I were close friends. He was like a grandfather to my three daughters. Uh, he would come to my house, I would go to his house and we would break bread together. Uh, Buck's personality was always positive. I uh, never saw bad in anything. Uh, and once you got to know him and his wife, or you realize that his personality came from her and not the other way around. Uh, Miss O'Neill had an awesome warmth about her, a very gracious attitude. And you could see where behind this great man, there was an even greater woman and or O'Neill. Uh, everybody loved her to death in, in school and and she was a role model before there were role models. Uh, but Buck was always gracious. Uh, well, a well-deserved honor to have Buck O'Neill in the Hall of Fame. Uh, the, the challenge back in 2006 was a lot of people who came into the museum gift shop confused Buck O'Neill with Buck Leonard. Hmm. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. And and so, you know, both men played first base. So there was a confusion that Buck O'Neill was the equal of Buck Leonard. 
uh, at bat, which was not the case. Now, Buck was a very good ball player, but not a great ball player. And as he would often tell me, I don't belong in that top 1%, Larry, but it would be nice if I got in. And he did. Yeah. So those are some of the dynamics that people don't realize that uh, I think the committee did what they thought was right. Uh, very good ball player, a very good manager. Uh, so well, well deserve honor of him making the Hall of Fame in 2022. Uh, I don't know what else I can say about Buck, but uh, just an all around great guy. Let's go back to his wife, uh, Aura, who was your teacher. Did she remember you as a student? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> no. No, teachers remember the bad students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but no, uh, she was so much fun to talk to. She had a great memory, but she didn't remember all of her students. Yeah. When did you become aware that she was married to this former Negro Leagues player and manager? Did that did that come much later? Yeah, probably. Uh, uh, probably in, in my mid thirties, and yeah, and and talking with Pamela Page, Sancho's daughter, who was also a teacher. We would talk about some teachers that influenced us growing up at Central. And she would mention, did, did you know uh, Orr was Buck's wife? I'm like, huh, what? Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't. And that's how it came about much, much later in life. You know, when you look at Buck's career, you know, what he did as a manager, uh, I thought was especially impressive. He was manager of some great Kansas City Monarchs teams. Um, but also, you know, when he joined the Cubs organization, he becomes the first black scout at the major league level. He was actually technically part of that college of coaches mm -hmm. in Chicago, which is kind of a failed experiment. But then later he becomes a scout and he helps sign, you know, some great players. Uh, I believe he was involved in the signing of Lou Brock. Oscar Gamble was a, a guy who started his career in the Cubs organization. Uh, so scouting was something that he was really good at. Uh, yes, yes, definitely. And you see some of Buck's personality transform into other ball players that he associated with. Uh, if you had a chance to talk to Ernie Banks, uh, Sweet Lou Johnson and Lou Brock, they were always upbeat. Uh, it was always a great day to play baseball never had anything negative to say about anyone or anything. And I think this this was a reflection of Buck O'Neill's influence in, in their game and personality. And I think that's why he, he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame because he, he kind of leveled the playing field despite the challenges of Jim Crow. Yeah. So Buck O'Neill, Bud Fowler, now members of the Baseball Hall of Fame, inducted last July here in Cooperstown. Larry, I want to talk to you about a program or initiative that's going on right now here at the Hall of Fame. Uh, you're one of the, uh, the curators for the Hall's ongoing Black Baseball initiative. It'll feature a new exhibit, but also uh, some programs, some new website features. There's a lot of things that are involved here. How did you become involved with this particular effort? Uh, I was extended an invitation by Tom Siebert and the tutorial team, uh, Nicole Retzler, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I jumped at the opportunity to participate uh, in this initiative. Uh, I think it's a great initiative in that they're seeking out Black voices to contribute uh, to this program. Uh, I think the Black experience is, is valuable and that we can add our content from our perspective of living in a segregated America and dealing with Jim Crow laws across the country. So uh, I welcome the opportunity. And so far, it's been an, an incredible experience and journey as I learned from them also. Larry, more than anything else, what would you like to see come out of this Black Baseball Initiative? If, if they could accomplish 
only one goal and there's more than one goal, but if, if there was just the one goal, what would you put at the top of the list? Hmm. I would probably say that the number one goal is black players have always belonged on the battlefield or the playing field. Uh, we have, they, they never should have been discriminated against uh, it, it boggles my mind as to why they were not given that opportunity to play in the 20s, 30s, in the early 40s. Uh, I don't understand the concept of segregation. Uh, it doesn't matter how much melanin you may have in your skin to hit a home run or throw a baseball 90 miles an hour. Uh, there are no statistics that should be separated by black or white or brown ball players. Uh, uh, America should be the melting pot of all nationalities and ethnic groups and baseball should reflect that. And I think that's where we're heading with this exhibit. I had a chance to go to the one, one of the meetings, I think it was back, I want to say in December, just before the holidays. And it was the only meeting I've, I've gone to for the Black Baseball Initiative, but I, I learned something right off the bat that Black players have been playing the game since the days of slavery. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, this is not just something, it didn't start with uh, William White and Moses Fleetwood Walker and Bud Fowler. This goes way back. This goes to, you know, the, uh, the early part of the 1800s, if not further back. Slaves, there's actually documentation of slaves having played baseball. I never knew that. Yes, that's true. Uh, we've always been a part of the game. Uh, I've been able to find newspaper accounts back in 1855. Uh, my first box score that I was able to find was in 1859. I mean, we're talking before the Civil War. Mm. Uh, the Black newspapers did document uh, several games, some better than others. Uh, so we've always had a presence on the playing field or the battlefield. Uh, it's just we're, we were excluded from the uh, uh, from the baseball encyclopedia, uh, which and hopefully we will correct that omission with the Black Baseball Initiative exhibits. You know, it's it's interesting with the announcement a couple of years ago, I think it was 2020, that Major League Baseball would would recognize the Negro Leagues as Major League. Statistics have now been integrated into websites like uh, Baseball Reference and, and Seam Heads. Um, but we used to have books. We used to have the Baseball Encyclopedia, as you mentioned. <laughs> we used to have Total Baseball. Uh, we haven't seen those books in recent years, so we <laughs> haven't seen a book reflecting that change. And I, I would guess, although that maybe goes beyond the Hall of Fame scope, that's probably something you'd like to see, right? Oh, most definitely. We need to put uh, uh, the Black players into the record books. Uh, that announcement in de December of 2020 was bittersweet. Uh, I think it's great that Major League Baseball will recognize statistics from the Negro Leagues, but I've always been enamored by uh, stats. Uh, as a kid, I went to the, to the games and I always purchased a scorecard and a little bitty pencil with no eraser for 15 cents. So uh, I learned how to keep score and I learned, I learned math. That's how I learned mathematical formulas. So, uh, I've always collected stats. Uh, uh, what happened in 1970 when Robert Peterson came out with the book, Only the Ball is White, I wanted to learn more and more and more. So I'm, I'm coming out of college in 71 and I started a journey of collecting every box score possible on the Negro Leagues. And that's before the internet. So I would spend my evenings at the public library putting dimes in the microfilm machine and printing out every box score I could find. And I started to compile stats. Uh, I created a, a database uh, 
and added up numbers and pitching and hitting. And I was just amazed that the numbers that came across that justified that Satchel Page was a great pitcher, Josh Gibson was a great hitter, Koo Papa Bell was a great outfielder, et cetera, et cetera. So the stats validated the stories that I had been told. And it took me probably 25 or 30 years to gather all these box scores <clears throat> uh, before the internet hit and made everything easier. But I learned so much, so much. I remember uh, <clears throat> in 1924, Bruce, I was uh, looking at the Kansas City Call newspaper and I kept coming up across, across this player by the name of Bullet Rogan. And this man was getting three and four hits almost every game. Uh, he played the outfield and he pitched every fourth or fifth game. And so I had to stop and take out my pencil and paper and start adding up his stats. And at the end of the 1924 season, this man has won 16 games. I think they played maybe 65 or 70 league games. And he was batting over 400. Mm -hmm. So I just sit there in the library and, and you know, that old saying, the same thing that'll make you laugh will make you cry. I just sit there and tears roll down my ears, <clears throat> down my eyes, because I, I said, who is this guy <laughs> named Bullet Rogan? I mean, tears of joy that I've, I've discovered this guy and tears of sadness as to why has America kept him from me? And a few years later, uh, when the internet came about, my handle, email handle was bulletrogan at aol.com. Mm. And I went on a mission to get him into the National Baseball Hall of Fame, which happened in 1998. Uh, his son lived right down the street from me and uh, his widow is still alive today. Yeah. So Little Bullet and I, we would get together and talk about his famous dad that nobody knew about. So. Mm. It's all about discovering greatness, Bruce. And that's that's the beauty of compiling stats to validate how great they are. A strikeout is a strikeout, a home run is a home run. <laughs> you know. And this, of course, is something you continue to do to this day. You're still involved with a number of research projects, writing efforts. Uh, Black History Month is an extremely busy time for you. You do a number of interviews. Uh, I couldn't have blamed you if you said no to the Hall of Fame on this Black Baseball <laughs> Initiative simply because you didn't have the time. But it's great that you, you feel it's important enough that you've added it to an already ridiculously busy schedule. Well, yes, uh, Black History Month is a a blessing and a, and a burden. Uh, the requests are overwhelming, but... Uh, I've got to squeeze the National Baseball Hall of Fame into my schedule. Uh, it means a lot to me that y'all continue to recognize these great ball players from uh, an era where they were not fully recognized. So I'm, I'm appreciative of what you and the Hall of Fame are doing. Our new Black Baseball exhibit will uh, debut about a year from now in 2024. Uh, but you'll also see some things uh, reflective of this initiative on our website and in some of the programs that we'll be offering uh, this year, 2023. Uh, Larry, it's a wonderful story about Bullet Rogan, and you start to learn the identities of some of these players, their great accomplishments. And another thing that's going to help us do this is your recent generous donation of many recorded interviews. Uh, with lots of, of important people from the history of Black baseball. And it's not just Hall of Famers. Uh, it's not just what we would call celebrities, but it's it's people that maybe even mainstream baseball fans don't have a great knowledge of. And we're going to talk about a few of these uh, interviews that you've done over the years that are now going to be part of the collection here. One of the people you had a chance to talk to was uh, this guy, Chet Brewer. A uh, pitcher with a long career, it stretched from the 1920s until the 1950s. Um, and then he did something really interesting in his later years, from 1985 to 1990. 
Chet Brewer coached uh, Los Angeles inner city athletes on weekends. And, um, you know, he worked with, um, you know, some, some famous uh, ball players along the way. He was uh, instrumental when he was a younger man on the careers of players like George Hendrick and Ellis Valentine and Reggie Smith. Um, I imagine talking to Chet Brewer, there'd be a lot of material to cover there. Oh, yes. Uh a lot of interviews with Chet Brewer and I visited his home in LA a few times and him and his wife Tina always fed me too much uh, but great interview I guess one of the best interviews I had with Chet Brewer was about the 1930 night game that he pitched in a 12 inning affair against Smokey Joe Williams where Smokey Joe struck out 27 ball players in 12 innings and Chet struck out 19. Uh, it's a four box score in the Kansas City American newspaper, also covered by the Kansas City Sun and the Kansas City Call, but I wanted more detail. And he provided some great detail on how he lost that game. <laughs> and uh, it was just interesting that he was able to remember play by play of that historic night game played at Muehlbach Field back in 1930 and how overpowering uh, Smokey Joe Williams was. Uh, in fact, he, Chet Brewer struck out 20, 10 straight Homestead Graves in the eighth, ninth and 10th inning. Wow. Uh, quite, the, quite, quite the game. And he was disappointed that he lost when the ball hit the third base bag bounced in the foul territory and the third baseman, Newt Joseph, couldn't get to it in time and Oscar Charleston scored the winning run. So that's the beauty of getting uh, eyewitness accounts of historic games. And he had so many tales and uh, probably, in my opinion, a future Hall of Famer. Uh, he beat Satchel Page two out of three games in head-to-head -head matchups. Mm. Uh, just just always a gentleman, uh, always gave me a lot of advice as a young man on how to carry myself and how to appreciate uh, the women in our lives. Larry, I'm curious about his attitude toward what he had to deal with, the segregation of that era. Was, was he at all, I guess, bitter might be the word for not being allowed to play? In the, uh, in the American or National League, or did he have more of a Buck O'Neill approach to things? Well, Chet Brewer was like many of the ballplayers that I interviewed. Uh, they had no bitterness about uh, segregated sanctions. Uh, as a minority, they realized they didn't have the power to make change, but they could influence uh, the naysayers by, by their talent on and off the field. Hmm. Uh, all the monarchs, once they signed a contract, were taken to 18th and Vine and given a suit and hat and some Stetson or Stacy Adams shoes. So they always looked good off the field. Uh, they had a code of conduct. And Chet was like many uh, ball players in that if they carried themselves in a high manner, uh, eventually white America would accept them for more than just second-class citizens. So they were not bitter, uh, had no animosity toward anyone. Uh, something that, that I, I took away from him and others. And, and I think Buck O'Neill emphasized that more than anything. Larry, did you talk to Chet at all about working with some of those young black athletes in LA, kids who would eventually make the major leagues? Well, yes, he wanted to give back to the community and he knew he knew he was an excellent pitcher. His record bears out an excellent one loss record, high strikeout per innings ratio. Uh, but he wanted to give back to Enos Cabell and many of those ball players in the uh, LA community, yeah. Did you have a chance to talk to any of those players like Enos Cabell about getting instruction from Chet Brewer? Uh, no, I never met Enos Cabell. I knew who he was. 
Never met him, no. Yeah. Well, a tremendous career for Brewer as uh, as a pitcher and then later as a coach. Uh, another interesting player, uh, not in the Hall of Fame, at least not at this point, but certainly worth talking about. Uh, you interviewed Quincy Troop. He had a long career as a catcher, uh, played in the Negro Leagues. Actually, you see him in the photo here. He was with the Cleveland Indians, I believe, in the early 1950s. Also had an incredibly long career in Latin America and uh, managed in the Negro Leagues as well. Tell us about Quincy Troop, what he was like. Quincy Troop was an outstanding uh, catcher, uh, the first black catcher in the American League and not Elston Howard. Mm. Uh, I think he came in in 1951, played maybe, I don't know, a few games, less than 10 games with the Indians. Uh, but that's the answer to that trivia question. Mm. Uh, Quincy and I wanted to rewrite his book uh, 20 years too soon. And so I traveled to St. Louis. That's where he was living at the time. Many, many trips and uh, many hours. And that's why I have so many recordings of him as we wanted to uh, rewrite his book. It had, it had been self-published. And... Uh, a lot of errors were in it. Some chapters were repeated accidentally, but uh, he had a good foundation, good memory. Uh, we could talk about everybody on the team position by position. Uh, he toured with uh, the Satchel Page All-Stars in 1946. Mm. He would talk about that experience of going against uh, Bob Feller and his All-Stars in 1946. Uh, of course, a lot of time spent in South America. He was a uh, manager of the Cleveland Buckeyes when they swept the Homestead Grays <laughs> in the 19, was that 47 World Series, somewhere around there. Uh, great ball player, great manager, great individual. Uh, Spent a lot of time in his living room. Great guy. And, and he was a photographer. A lot of your film and photographs come from Quincy Troop's collection. So uh, just to sit there in that living room and see album after album of photographs of some of these great ball players was uh, mind boggling. You must have had some entertaining stories about catching and working with Satchel Page. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, too many to share, but, uh, you know, when you're catching a picture like Satchel Page with great control, it's an easy job. And uh, Chrissy had nothing but good things to say about Satchel Page and others. So uh, another role model. Uh, um, I miss him greatly. Yeah. You know, for years, we've heard that story about, you know, Satchel, you know, having the catcher put a matchstick down at the plate, and then he could throw the ball right over the matchstick. Did Quincy confirm any of those stories? Oh, they were definitely true. Yeah. Uh, Satchel was unique. Uh, of course, in 1965, I saw him pitch at the age of 59 for the Kansas City Athletics. Uh he didn't walk a batter in those three innings that he pitched against the Boston Red Sox. Yeah. He didn't have the speed that he once had, but he knew how to hit the spots, hit the corners, and uh, he shut them down for three innings and only gave up that one hit to uh, Carl Yastrzemski. Yeah. Uh, which was which was good because I was keeping the score, and I'm like, wow, uh, Satchel's behind in the count. He's going to have to bring one over the plate in the next pitch. Uh, Yes, doubled off the outfield wall. So uh, that's the beauty of keeping score. You know what's going, what's, what's happening. Uh, but no, uh, a lot of fun, fun times in my journey uh, about black baseball. I've, I've really in, in, in enjoyed myself. Uh, and Quincy Troop was always a pleasure to work with and interview. I have to follow up on on Page. So uh -huh. you were at the game when he pitches at the age of fifty nine. Uh -huh. He pitched extremely well. Um, I've I've seen a recent video clip that shows that he still had a pretty live fastball. Uh, I've always wondered, you know, he pitched so well in that game. Why didn't he pitch any more? 
<laughs> well, I think it's because of his age. After the game, Bruce, I always wondered what the ball players thought. And I would say 10 years later, uh, I wrote every ball player on the Red Sox and the athletics to get their point of view. Mm -hmm. and I probably still have those letters around there somewhere. Half the teams, half the players uh, did respond to my letters. And Wayne Causey was playing third base for the athletics. And in his letter, he said he was scared to death because Satchel was not throwing that hard. <laughs> but he was pitching around the hitters in and out, up and down. Uh, but a lot of the letters that came back said they were amazed at how good he really was. Yeah. So that, that's the beauty of what we do. Uh, of course, I didn't get a letter from Jack from uh, Carl Yaskripsky, but the other letters were very revealing about the greatness of Leroy Satchel yeah. Page. That's an incredible accomplishment. You know, if he wasn't throwing hard, he was still getting those guys out. And you know, <laughs> they were giving a full effort. They weren't going to. They weren't yeah, this game was beautiful, line. Bruce. I mean, he came out for the fourth inning. And uh, the manager, Haywood Sullivan, came to the mound and took the ball from him. You could tell it was all staged. And the crowd went crazy mm. as Diego Segui came in to uh, relieve Satchel Page. Yeah. And he walked off the mound and doffed his hat. And everybody went crazy, including me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's terrific. Getting back to Quincy Troop, um, just to kind of put a close on that, you talked earlier uh, about um, Chet Brewer being a candidate for the Hall of Fame. Uh, was Quincy Troop that kind of player? Is he a, is he a possible candidate for future election? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, great ball player, but not in the top 1%. Okay. Uh, I'm just being honest. Uh, yeah. Great ball player. I mean, yeah. the stats show that, and uh, I wouldn't have any problem with him being in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> right. Well, maybe the photography that he did will give him a, give him an extra boost. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about some of the other people that you've done interviews with, and and these will be part of the, I guess, the Larry Lester collection here at the Hall of Fame. Uh, you talked to Tony Stone, the first woman to play. Uh, in Negro Leagues baseball, that must have been a fascinating conversation. Oh, my goodness, yes. I found Tony by accident. I, I came across a letter that she wrote about 50 years earlier. Uh, and the letterhead had an Oakland address. So I wrote her. Said, maybe she's still there. And she wrote back. Mm. <laughs> and so we exchanged phone numbers. And we talked by phone a lot. And uh, she came to Kansas City. Uh, uh, we met at uh, Bobby Bell's restaurant, uh, the former Kansas City Chiefs Hall of, Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. And I, I was surprised uh, when she walked in, she was very rugged looking, very well dressed, uh, had a bow-legged walk. Her hands were very rough. Uh, but they were manicured and she sit down and she has this high pitched voice, extremely feminine, uh, very ladylike, but her outward appearance was very rugged. Mm. And she gave me some awesome interviews and we became good friends. Uh, I remember one Christmas night she called me after I put the kids to bed and we talked for hours, she was in Oakland two hours ahead of my time. And we, we talked, uh, she was kind of lonely and we talked about her life and the passing of her husband. And Tony was one of my uh, favorite people to know. And she was an advocate for equal rights. She would tell me, despite what the owners say, I'm not wearing a, a skirt on the field. Uh, I'm not going to wear my hair down. I came here to play baseball. And she was serious about the game. 
So Larry, um, that's a true story that the owner um, of, of the uh, clowns, I forget his name, wanted her to wear a skirt and she said, absolutely not. That's true. Yes, yeah, she told me that. Yeah. Uh, she knew she was a gate attraction, but uh, and she always wanted to play baseball. So she was a natural uh, ball player. Uh, she liked the strength to be a heavy hitter. But uh, she did bat about 250 that, that season with the Monarchs in 54. Mm -hmm. Played with the Clowns in 53. Uh, with uh, Hank Aaron. Uh, so it, it was a good it was a good run. Uh, Tony was a sweetheart. Yeah, love Tony. Based on what I've read, she more than held her own on the field. But she was not well received, and it wasn't just from the opponents, but it was her own teammates. They did not throw out the welcome mat, correct? Well, that's true. Uh, I interviewed her manager, Buster Haywood, uh, at his home in L.A., and he was adamant about, I did not want her on my team. Really? I did not want a woman on my team. I didn't want to deal with the consequences. Uh and Buster, I always felt was honest with me, uh, but he was he had to take orders from management, I mean ownership rather, mm -hmm. uh, and to play Tony. Uh, so uh, Tony was sharing second base with Ray Neal, who was leading the league in batting at the time. So as a manager, he did not want to give Tony. A uh, that time when he would have to take out one of his best hitters at second base, Ray Neal. I've read, Larry, that she uh, once did, or maybe more than once, face Satchel Page and got a hit against him. Is that true? <laughs> yes, uh, that is true. Uh, Tony would just, she already had a high voice, but when she talked about Satchel Page, it became squeaky. That <laughs> she did get a hit against Satchel. Uh, we don't know whether Satchel uh, gave up a hit or whether Tony actually got a hit. Uh, we will never know the, the truth uh, behind that that hit. <laughs> yeah, that single. I have a couple of photographs up here. One is with uh, the Clowns, which was the first team she played for in the Negro Leagues. Then she played for the Monarchs. The other photo. I found uh, when putting this PowerPoint together, uh, it's for a team called the Creoles. Was that a, a semi-pro club? Uh, yes, uh, I forget where, it's, where they're out of, uh, down south, the Louisiana base team. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, she had been playing baseball at a minor league level before she came uh, to the pros. Yeah. Final question on Tony Stone, Larry. Given the resentment she faced from her own manager, her own teammates, did she consider quitting at all? Did she think, hey, this isn't worth it? Or was she determined to just see it through? Uh, she was a very determined individual. Uh, <clears throat> she thought she was making an impact. She thought she would get better each and every year. Uh, <clears throat> she had a few injuries. Uh, that kept her out of the game and, and kept her from excelling. Uh, we'll never know the true legacy and the impact that she had on the game, but uh, she's definitely uh, an icon in my memory and uh, worthy of her place in baseball history. One of the person I'd like to talk to, uh, talk about, um, whom you featured in these recorded interviews, uh, is this gentleman, uh, not a player, but famed sports writer, Sam Lacey. He was a journalist for seven decades. He was one of the writers who really fought uh, extremely hard for the inclusion of Black players in the established major leagues. 1997, he won the Spink Award, now the BBWAA Career Excellence Award. Uh, but you had a chance to talk to uh, Sam, a groundbreaking writer, a great gentleman. Tell us about that. Uh, Sam Lacey, I consider him my mentor. He's on my Mount Rushmore of writers who influenced me, along with Wendell Smith, uh, Shirley Povich, and <clears throat> uh, Lester Rodney of the New York Daily Worker. Uh, I met Sam uh, at the Baltimore All-Star Game. I think that was in 
1993, uh, somewhere around there. And we hit, we hit it off immediately. Uh, he would ask me some tough questions and I gave him a direct answer. I didn't sugarcoat my answers about the DH rule or steroids and uh, he took a liking to me. So he invited me to his home in Washington, DC. I made many trips to his home, sit there in his living room. And we had such a great time. Uh, I was in awe of this man. Uh, he had Olympic press passes all over his house. I mean, he had actually went to the 1936 Berlin Olympics. And him, he had pictures of him and Jesse Owens and other Olympians. Pictures of him with Joe Lewis and him with Jackie Robinson. And he didn't think anything about it, but his apartment was just full of uh, uh, documents. And we would talk and talk. And he gave me some of the greatest insights to many ball players. Uh, I mean, he, he told me, you know, and I asked him about Satchel Page's lack of a curveball. He said, well, you know, I saw Walter Johnson pitch many times with the Senators. He didn't have a curveball. <laughs> I'm like, what? He said, yes. He threw that same fastball, sidearm, three quarters or overhand. And that's how he got batters out. But Walter Johnson didn't have a curveball. You know, and as a young man, I only know what I read in the history books, but this man was an eyewitness account, two ball players. And uh, his, his editorials reflect uh, his attitude about injustices and a corrective, uh, a corrective way to change the narrative about why can't we play with with the white guys in Major League Baseball. Uh, Sam was he was incredible, forthcoming, and very honest. I I, I loved talking to him. Uh, we had the same mindset. I remember once we were we were really deep into a discussion. He said, well, you know, at three o'clock, you need to get yourself out of here because the golf tournament is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> so I made sure I wrapped it up before three o'clock that day. Yeah. We've we've touched upon only four of your interview subjects, but there, there are many others. Uh, I haven't seen the, the master list, uh, but if you were to estimate how many interviews or how many different people you talk to that are included in those interviews? Give us a ballpark figure on that. Mm, I have no idea how many players I interviewed. Uh, more than 50? But definitely more than 50. Some of them were never on tape. Mm. Uh, some of them I just sit around and we chatted and I took notes. I think I've donated roughly 8,000 hours to the Hall of Fame. I don't know how many players were involved, uh, but it, it was, it's been a journey. Uh, I've offered the tapes to four other institutions and the common reply was we would love to have them, but uh, we'll get back with you. Mm. Uh, when I offered them to uh, the Hall of Fame, within 24 hours, they said we're ready to accept them. Uh, that's. Uh, testament to what the Hall of Fame is all about, instead of giving me lip service. Uh, I mean, I'm in good health, uh, but I lost a classmate this morning. Uh, so there is some urgency to make sure that my collection finds a home. And I think the Hall of Fame is the place for that. Well, we're glad you thought of us. 8,000 hours, a lot of great stuff there. And we'll be talking more about that um, as more information becomes available. Uh, Larry, we do have some questions that have come in on the chat. So I want to get to those in our final few minutes here. Uh, first one comes in from Arnold. Uh, he writes, between 1947 and 1970, Black Americans and Black Hispanics won 16 MVPs in the National League, but only three MVPs in the American League over that same time. Why do you think the American League lagged so far behind the National League in bringing in Black players? Well, basically the answer is the ownership. Uh, many of the owners of American League teams were not progressive in hiring Black and Brown players. As I mentioned earlier, the 1960 Kansas City Athletics did not have a single Black ball player on their roster. 
uh, the National, National League was more aggressive. Uh, when I was doing some research on the All-Star game many years ago, when the National League dominated the All-Star game, uh, I found three out of nine of the starters were black and brown in the National League, and only one out of nine players for the American All-Star team was black or brown. Uh, the National Leagues, I think, just were more aggressive in signing players like Roberto Clemente and Hank Aaron and Willie Mays, so forth and so on. So I, I think it all goes back to ownership. I don't have the answer, but I, I think the owners of National League teams were just more aggressive and more progressive uh, in their attempt to put a better team on the field. Question from David. Mr. Lester, I really enjoyed your East-West All-Star Game book. I uh, wanted to ask you, have you had the opportunity to visit the Jackie Robinson Museum in New York City? <laughs> uh, no, I have not had an opportunity to visit the Jackie Robinson Museum, but I am scheduled to go there this year on April the 15th. <laughs> oh, nice. Very good. You get your taxes done in the morning and then you go to the museum at night, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Next up, Steve. Uh, do you think someday Major League Baseball will play its annual special game at a former Negro League stadium, maybe the soon to be renovated Hinchcliffe Stadium in Patterson? Of course, we've had the, the Field Dreams games the last couple of years. Uh, Steve wants to know if you think they'll do something like that at one of these Negro League parks. I think it'd be a great idea to have a, a Major League game played at Hinchcliffe. A stadium uh, or Rickwood Field in Birmingham. Uh, yeah, show homage to uh, the greatness of these men of color. I think that's a great idea. Have you been to that ballpark, Larry? Not the one, not Hinchcliffe, but I have been to the one in, in Birmingham, Rickwood. Rickwood, yeah. What do you think of Rickwood? <laughs> I love it. I mean... <laughs> I mean, I absolutely love walking around that field. I, I did a research once and I found that more than 100 Hall of Famers, Cooperstown Hall of Famers actually played in that field. Yeah. I don't think no one, no park in the country can can beat that. Uh, so, I, you know, I was, I was blessed to be there, uh, you know, where Reggie Jackson and Everybody else played. I mean, great experience. Love, love the park. All right. One final question comes in from John. He wants to know, do you know when the Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center, Research Center in Kansas City will open? Uh, that's the million dollar question. They've been working on it for about 17 years. And uh, I don't know the details for the delay, uh, but hopefully it will open up soon very soon uh based on what i've seen visually uh it looks like it's ready to open today but yeah uh i don't know the logistics uh or the delay of why it's not open our guest has been uh, larry lester uh outstanding historian of black baseball uh, many times an author award winner and very much involved in our Black Baseball Initiative, as we talked about earlier, has donated an extensive archive of recorded interviews, about 8,000 hours of interviews uh, with a number of uh, standout figures in the history of Black Baseball. Uh, Larry, we certainly thank you for that, uh, that generous donation, the donation of your time over this past hour as well. Uh, it's always good talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, for having me, and thank you for the privilege of your time. It's Always great to visit with you and see my friends at the Hall of Fame. Same here. Larry Lester has been our guest on Virtual Voices of the Game. We thank him for his time. We thank you all for your time as well. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.